from the heights of contentment, being married to a city princess, having two wonderful children, owning a business that was doing well, and living in my hometown where I always wanted to live, to the depths of hell in a matter of weeks. This is my story. I live in Culver, a small town in the Midwest. The population of our small community is only a thousand souls. The nearest settlement, a small town with a population of 20,000 people, is located about 60 miles from us. There are other small towns in between. We have several convenience stores, the precursors to Walmart you know, like little find-it-all stores that mostly sold groceries but had sections for toys, clothing, office supplies, cameras, sundries, and even patterns and fabrics for those who considered themselves seamstresses. We also have a small pharmacy, a local True Value franchise, a farm store, several coffee shops, a large local bank, and a small credit union. Additionally, there's my computer services business. My company, in general, was engaged in IT consulting. I sold hardware, computers, servers, and monitors, but mainly to those who were interested in a full package of services, including networks. My clients included a bank, a local hospital, and a school system. My closest competitor was in a larger city, but I had clients even there and often had to troubleshoot competitor networks. Oh, I think I should introduce myself. My name is Tim Mayeron. I am 30 years old. For those who are interested, I am 183 centimeters tall and weigh 82 kilograms if I get wet. Until recently, I was married to a girl I knew all through middle and high school, Becky Maines Mayeron, who will soon be remarried as our divorce is finalized. We were married for seven years. I thought they were good years, but apparently, she didn't think they were so good because she stunned me with her divorce announcement. Now, I must state that we were not high school sweethearts. We practically did not communicate with each other as we ran with different crowds. We studied at the same university, but even there, we did not communicate. In the same classes, we didn't communicate at school since she was a local princess. Her dad, Ronald Maines, owned the only bank in town, Maines Federal Bank. It lends to local farmers, the feed store, local stores, Ned's supermarket, and most other local businesses and almost everyone in town gets auto and home loans through the bank. I think we all like to meet our banker face to face, which is why internet banking hasn't caught on here. I even have a small operating loan from my father-in-law. Well, let's get back to Becky. It was only after we received our bachelor's degrees that she suddenly became interested in me. I was a bit of a fanatic about her when we were in school. She was a pretty blonde of decent height and weight with a nice bust and ass, and a major cheerleader. I was a starting quarterback during the football season, a starting offensive lineman in basketball, ran the 1,000 and 2,000 meters in track and field, and played center field in baseball. Becky wasn't exactly a stuck-up person. She'd contradict that generalization if you threw it at her, but she did display that attitude about herself. She dated a quarterback who played point guard and pitched in baseball. Josh was a good guy and a great athlete. He went to another university on a full scholarship to play football, and that's where they parted ways. Like I said, I didn't move in the same circles that Becky did during college. She was a high-ranking member of her sorority, the largest on campus, and their respective fraternity was the largest on campus. There were always fraternity or sorority-sponsored activities to fill time outside of class. On the other hand, I was a nerd. I spent a lot of time outside of class learning about hardware and software, as well as various systems and the intricacies of computerizing them. My choice of major required at least as much time studying as I spent in classes. In addition, I needed to have a job to pay for what the small scholarship did not allow. My father was the manager of Ned's Superstore, so his salary wasn't huge, just enough to keep me from grants. Just to give an example of scale, you could multiply the square footage of my parents' house by four, and it still wouldn't be as big as Ronald Maines' primary residence. In the summer, my father and I went hiking almost every weekend. Fishing was a cheap but enjoyable activity. Becky and her parents flew to Aspen, the Ozarks, Miami, sometimes Hawaii, and then Maine just to fool around and laugh. Do you get the idea? We were very different people who were simply lucky to grow up in the same small town. When I returned home from school, Becky suddenly wanted to date me. She almost followed me. I never really understood her interest. Yes, 
I started my own business, but at the time I was working alone. I applied for a small business grant to get startup capital, and after the first year, I was making a small profit. One evening, when we were both in the same bar with a live band, Becky finally decided to ask me to dance. We suited each other very well. Mom insisted that I learn different dances, so I didn't do too badly. We broke up when the bar closed for the night, kissing outside her car and making me promise to call the next day for a real date. I was an only child, something in my mother's uterus did not allow the fetus to develop normally. I must have been a miracle child. Becky had a brother who left home at 18 and disappeared from the face of the earth. I don't think he liked Ronald very much. A year after I graduated from high school, my dad died of a sudden heart attack. Mom said he was talking about mowing the yard, and after a while, she noticed something sticking out of the door of a small shed at the back of the property. My father lost consciousness, and by the time my mother noticed it, it was too late. The ambulance guys didn't even try to revive him, he'd been gone too long. Becky attended her father's funeral. Although we only had a few dates, I was glad to see her there. At the cemetery, she came to my side and held my hand as tears streamed down my face. She was also very kind to my mother and some of the small family who went to great lengths to support us. Mom's house was fully paid off before Dad died, and he had a nice life insurance policy that would guarantee her an income for the rest of her life if she was careful. Thank God for that, given recent developments. I will return to this later. An old joke about a guy who chased a girl until she caught him. Well, it wasn't like that with Becky and me. She was following me. She asked me out on a date. She was the initiator of our sex life. I won't go into details. I'll just say that sexually, we suited each other very well. We started dating each other exclusively, at least from my point of view, and I didn't hear any rumors about her dating others. We had sex two or three times a week. There were days when I had to travel to some remote settlements. Some large farms wanted to integrate all their computers, from tractors to cedars to milking parlors to home computers. They all had to have access to Wi-Fi, since the buildings are sometimes located a considerable distance from each other. Logistical obstacles had to be overcome, so I don't know if Becky was at home at her parents' house on those evenings when I was too busy to see her. Oh yeah, I forgot to talk about Becky's work. Since her major was women's studies, she couldn't find a suitable job in Culver and went to work for her dad. She started as a cashier and quickly rose to vice president of the lending department. Of course, it was nepotism, but she threw herself into her work and received an education as her father wanted in the field of banking. Years later, I can look back and see how I was duped into marriage. One evening before Christmas that year, Becky told me she was pregnant and asked what I was going to do about it. Guided by the values instilled in me by my parents, I proposed to her immediately. I should have immediately realized the true status of my beloved's pregnancy when she and her mother chose a date seven months after announcing our engagement that Christmas. By the time I finally realized that she had lied about being pregnant, plans had already been made, and a huge number of invitations had been sent out. When I asked Becky about this, she just shrugged. Her explanation, if I had left everything up to you, we would never have gotten married, let alone engaged. I love you, and you love me, it will work. As for me, I was in love with the city princess, the sex was amazing, and I really wanted to sleep with and around Becky. So, I agreed and left no stone unturned. When I realized she had lied about being pregnant, the wedding was the largest in our city in anyone's memory. Everyone was invited. We even held it on a Sunday afternoon so that all the businesses had time to close. The holiday was extraordinary. It was organized by a company from our urban area. We honeymooned in Barbados, where Becky found a clothing optional beach and was naked almost every day we were there. The sex was alternately loving and tender and rough and violent. We did it all. We explored the island by scooter and even snorkeled in the clear Caribbean Sea. After two weeks of hedonism, we returned to work. I now had one person working for me, and before our marriage ended, the staff had expanded to three technicians and an accounting secretary to keep us all organized and in order. About a year after their wedding, Becky announced that she was pregnant. This time, the alarm was not false. Constance, my little Connie, was born with all ten fingers and toes and was destined to be spoiled to death. However, she is my little girl. 
Two years after that, Thaddeus, or Tav for short, was born. He too was born fully formed. My life was complete, and I was as happy as a pig in the mud. In the seventh year of life, everything changed. Becky suddenly needed to work many evenings and several weekends. I could understand the need to hold banking conferences occasionally, but it was a slow year, and there couldn't be enough influx of loan applications to justify all those evening meetings and weekends. Becky always answered the phone if I called, but I tried not to bother her unless it was important. There weren't any missed calls, not one time she answered out of breath, but I was still a little concerned. Our sex life also suffered as Becky was rarely home before I went to bed. Many evenings, I had to go to bed immediately after the children because I was traveling to serve my clients. Yes, I had more assistance, but this was only so that I did not chase my own tail. We were all very busy, but I planned my days so that I could be home in the evenings, especially if Becky couldn't be counted on to look after the children. I remember the last time I made love to my wife. I got home on Friday night, and lo and behold, she arrived before me and cooked dinner for us. The children were overjoyed and talked to their mother throughout dinner, so much so that we had to ask them to eat. We then cleared the table and put the pots, pans, and dishes in the dishwasher before sitting down together and watching Shrek for the hundredth time. The children were so happy to see Becky that she had to put them to bed for the night. That evening, I was not allowed to go near their bedroom after they settled down. Becky returned to the living room with a couple of glasses of wine, high heels, and some kind of fluff called a baby doll, which emphasized her beauty and made my manhood rock hard in my pants. We settled on the couch and sipped wine while Becky whispered about what she wanted me to do that night. She didn't want affection and love. No, she wanted hard sex. I didn't know if I could cope with this task because quite a lot of time had passed since our last meeting, and I was sure that I would reach the finish line too quickly. I gave her everything I could and fell into a deep sleep. When I woke up on Saturday morning, Becky was already dressed and holding an envelope in her hands. Time to wake up, idiot. Where was yesterday's loving woman? Why is the term dumb used? The children are already dressed and ready to go to mom and dad. This is where I will be staying this weekend. You'll have about 48 hours to get your crap out of my house. If you become upset, a protective order will be issued against you on Monday morning, citing mental cruelty and violent tendencies. At the same time, the divorce documents contained in the envelope will be filed. I was shocked. Finally, I found my voice and asked, What's going on, and why are you doing this? It's just, dumbass, Josh came to work at the bank as his dad's right-hand man, and we're going to get married as soon as the ink is dry on my divorce papers. We've been getting reacquainted for months, and now is the time to pull the trigger. As she left, she stopped to throw one last grenade into my life. By the way, Josh can't have children, so he wants to adopt Constance, and thus, they will now always be addressed by their names and not by those village nicknames that you came up with. As she left, she slammed the door. I spent the first 12 hours of that weekend reading and rereading the contents of the envelope. Rebecca, no longer Becky, wanted not only the house but also my business. The terms stated that I could still run the business but would only receive minimum wage, less than even the rest of the team. She wanted full custody. The requested amount of child support would be more than what I would actually earn, given the demands. She also demanded alimony, although her earnings would be many times more than mine. Her car was in her name, but mine belonged to the company. As long as I worked for the company, I could drive it. We had some savings, not very much since we were still young, but some. She had already withdrawn all but a few dollars from the account. I didn't even get half of it. I finally decided to stop reading and thinking and get down to business. I called everyone I knew and found someone who could lend me a pickup truck and trailer. I didn't have my own friends, only our ones, and I knew that they wouldn't help. I ended up calling a few guys I'd talked to at school, and they came over right away, and we packed the trailer with stuff Becky wouldn't handle. I had nowhere else to go, so I went to work. The year before, I bought an entire building so we could have more room to expand. On the second floor, at the back of the building, there was a small apartment, shabby and dirty. I rolled up my sleeves and spent the entire day on Sunday cleaning. The air mattress was my bed. Friends lent me some old furniture and some pots and pans so I could eat and have something to sit on. 
a small microwave would suffice for a while until I found a stove. I also needed a refrigerator, but I made do with a cooler with ice for beer. On Monday, I woke up crumpled and with body pain. I don't recommend using an air bed unless it's a last resort. The shower was cold as there was no hot water on the second floor, only a small tank for the bathroom in the office downstairs. I managed to shave and look more or less presentable. I called several local lawyers, and it soon became clear to me that I was being viewed as on par with a mass murderer. My father-in-law made it clear I would not be provided with any assistance or loans. I didn't have time to call a lawyer from afar, so that morning, I went to court representing myself. Judge Gavin presided. I had a very bad feeling. The judge was always present at all Maine's family events, and I would be willing to bet that his car and house loans were through Maine's federal bank. He addressed his first comments to me. Mr. Mayoron, why aren't you represented by a lawyer? Judge, I apologize, but my wife handed me the documents on Saturday morning, and I was only able to look for a lawyer this morning before the trial. No local lawyer will take my case. I ask for a delay so that I can find a lawyer for more distant places. Denied. I do not understand this. According to the case file, these documents were filed three weeks ago, and a trial date was set at that time. The file also states that a sheriff's deputy served you at your place of employment that same day. You have had enough time to seek the help of a lawyer and submit the necessary documents confirming your financial situation. I must find you in contempt of court for your blatant attempt to delay the proceedings. Your Honor, I would like to protest and hope that this will be entered into the official record of the court. I believe that I am being pushed into a settlement that is entirely in favor of my wife and is being done only to destroy me and not to help my children in any way. Since all of my income documents are filed jointly, my wife should have been able to present my financial situation and thus defeat all claims. For unjustified alimony. In addition, she announced that she plans to remarry as soon as our divorce is finalized, so alimony should not be an issue. He hit the table with a hammer. Be silent, you sir have disturbed the order. You have had sufficient time to respond to the subpoena. I find in favor of the plaintiff. He slammed the gavel again, stood up, and left the room. I was shocked. In a matter of minutes, I was divorced. It would be very difficult for me to see my children, and my business was taken away. I looked at my ex-wife, Rebecca. At least she looked a little guilty about what she had just done. She pulled herself together and looked at me with an arrogant look. You better get to work. I'm not paying you to sit around and look like someone just pissed in your Cheerios. Hatred had become an increasingly dominant emotion due to the confusion of the past few days. I had to restrain myself as I saw that the bailiff was closely watching me. He didn't look too friendly. Joshua and the stood up and followed their lawyer out the door. I sat and waited. I needed to not give them a reason to throw me in jail. Somehow, I came to the conclusion that this was one of their goals. If I had been jailed for losing my temper, her accusations would have been credible. The bailiff came up and said quietly, they should already be out of the building. Other BFFs are watching them. But you know what influence the Mains have in this city and in the whole area? Find yourself a lawyer in your state capital, it should be far enough. We support and sympathize with you, but we cannot risk being discovered. I nodded and thanked him. When I walked outside, several people in uniform lined up to watch me leave. I went to the office. Surprisingly, Rebecca and Joshua weren't ahead of me. I thought they would kick their butts to let the employees know who the new owners are. Now their arrogance cost them dearly. First, I made sure that all employees were busy completing tasks. Then I wrote a check for cash and sent our accounting secretary to the bank to cash it. I asked her to tell anyone who might doubt it that I was going to be out of town for a few days serving remote clients and would need cash. I figured that if I went to the bank myself, there would be orders to stop me unless a judge has signed a court order stating who now owns the business. The bank should not deny the business the funds, this was not unusual since in many small towns cash is preferred over debit or credit cards as banks and credit card companies charge a percentage of each transaction from the businesses themselves. Since my name was still on the bank card with my signature, I could withdraw as much money as I needed. I realized that my credit and debit cards were no longer functional, so I needed some of that old green stuff, you know, with the dead president on every bill. 
There was more than enough money in the account to pay next week's pay, but I didn't want my employees to suffer. I only withdrew a couple thousand. I also emptied my petty cash drawer and left iOS for my ex-wife and her stallion. Now I had to act like the beaten person that I was. The thirst for revenge flared up in my gut and consumed me. Somehow, Rebecca, Joshua, and Ronald would have to pay for what they did. Why Ronald? Come on, do you really think that this and her ex-lover would stoop to destroying me? I think it was Ronald who pulled the strings and orchestrated the whole thing. Otherwise, I would have been served with the lawsuit three weeks ago and would have hired a local lawyer. The judge would have been fair in his decision. No, Ronald was behind it all. He never wanted me to be his son-in-law, and now, with his daughter's permission, he was going to make me pay. Late in the evening, Rebecca and Joshua deigned to come to the office and take over the cases. They showed Stacy, the secretary, the signed court papers transferring ownership to the new corporation, and that I was now only a manager, not an owner-manager. Luckily, they didn't publicly humiliate me by announcing my new salary. With the exception of Stacy, who must have known, they needed to take a pay cut. No one else knew that they were making more per week than I was. I knew Stacy would let everyone know, but for now, business had to continue as before. When this creepy couple showed up, I excused myself, saying that I needed to go to a client's office, and left. I wasn't going to go to jail for violating a protective order. This would also play into their hands. At least the protective order prohibited me from approaching them closer than 30 meters. If the distance is greater in our small town, then I might as well sleep under a bridge outside the city. After work, I went to one of the local bars. The owner was one of my clients. I computerized his point of sale so that even the taps were integrated and could give him reports and automatically order alcohol as needed. He met me at the bar. Sorry, Ted, but I can't serve you. The word has already been announced. Anyone who serves you, sells you something, or even talks in a friendly way will speed up the repayment of your loans, and no one can handle that. You'll have to leave. He winked at me and nodded towards the back door. I knew where the gaps were in his security camera system, so I nodded and left, pressing myself against the wall. I slid to the back and met him at the back door. Under his arm, he had a package of my favorite beer. Ted, I'm so sorry. Take this as a peace offering. I hope Miz gets over his frustration and stops this crap. That was all he said before slipping back into the building. I hugged the wall again and walked back to my small, lonely apartment. When I got there, I found a used but still usable mattress, box springs, and a Hollywood frame leaning against the back door. Wow, I don't have to sleep on this air anymore. After putting the beer on ice, I dragged the bed into my apartment and set it up. It was the best night's sleep, aided by five or six bottles of beer and a comfortable bed. The next day, I went to Ned's to buy groceries. I got to the checkout and was shown out the door without my groceries. Ned himself came out to kick me out. Ted, I like you and your family, but I can't stand up to Ronald Maines. He'll shut me down in a week if he finds out I talk to you. When I kick you out, I'm really sorry. Say hello to your mother. He made a face as if he was angry with me, probably because of the witnesses and the security camera, and pushed me into the door. That evening, all the groceries I had chosen were in a wooden box with a padlock next to my back car door. The key was on the driver's side front wheel. I emptied the box and left it outside. I tried to move it, but it was damn heavy. When I examined the bottom, I found that there were steel plates attached to it. Apparently, my unknown benefactor did not want anyone to steal the box. Yes, it wouldn't stop someone who really wanted to scam me, but at least an ordinary person wouldn't do anything. I went out of town for a couple of days to serve a few more clients. The germ of an idea began to grow. I couldn't get what I wanted locally, so I stopped at a small service station outside of town and bought a few small cans of fuel. I bought regular gasoline and some diesel. Every time I went out of town, I bought a couple of things necessary to carry out my plan. During this time, Rebecca and Joshua tried to make my life hell. I had to change my phone number because she was calling me several times a day. Then a police officer came to me and accosted me with accusations of violating a protective order. I argued that I never answered the phone, so I couldn't be the offender. 
the policeman told me to stop acting out and left again. It got to the point where I couldn't even put gas in my car, a company car, mind you. I had to send someone else to fill the car so I could do my job. My plan came to full fruition when Fred Main started going after my mother. They called her several times a day, asking her to come and apply for a reverse mortgage. The county claimed it had not received her tax payment. When I called the tax man, he whispered into the phone that Ronald Maines was pressuring him to screw my mother. Now the bastard had to pay. He couldn't threaten his mom about the mortgage, but he pestered her in other ways. She didn't need this stress. A week was all I needed to get ready. It must be the middle of the night when there are only a couple of cops on duty who usually sleep in their cars. Then I could prepare. During the day, I would sneak out and drive to another city to take a nap in my car. I also bought a rattling old pickup truck from a farmer about 40 miles away. I did not immediately register my ownership since the license plates were valid for several more months. He took it to an old abandoned house a mile outside of town and hid it behind the house for me. I put the plan into action right after all the businesses in town closed for the night. Before starting work, I walked around them and made sure that they were all already dark. I wanted no one to get hurt, but maybe a select few people could have gotten physically hurt, and I wouldn't have cared. It's time to act. First, I went to the office and remotely disabled the fire alarm systems of each business I was going to attack. These systems were integrated into their networks, and they all used my business to set up the systems. I did not contact the hospital or even the bank because federal laws could be violated if their systems were deliberately tampered with. I went to a convenience store on the outskirts of town. There was enough brick to break the glass in the door. I mixed diesel and gasoline in a bottle to make a Molotov cocktail. I lit a wick soaked in gasoline, threw it at the door, and it caught on the edge of the shelf. The bottle broke. Then I went to the other end of the city and repeated my actions in another store. I heard the sirens when the volunteer fire department responded to the first fire. I smiled to myself. Ronald was elected chief of the volunteer fire department and also served on the fire department's board of trustees. He was always reluctant to spend money on any improvements. Tonight was supposed to show him the error of his ways. I went to a farm supply store. This manager was a disgusting even when I wasn't being harassed there. I used three cocktails in different parts of the building to make sure the fire was growing. Because the fire alarm and suppression systems were integrated, the sprinklers worked, but the alarm did not sound. I was convinced that the fire was too big. Before the sprinklers could work without additional water supply from the fire department, the sprinkler system was soon overloaded. As much of the city's commercial district was engulfed in flames, I called my former home on the landline. When Rebecca answered, I told her briefly and clearly, using an electronic device I bought at a toy store, Darth Vader informed her that there was an arsonist in the house and that she should take herself and the children to Ted Mirren's mother's house for safety. Sitting on a nearby street, I watched as about an hour later, Rebecca left with the children and headed to her parents' mansion. I knew she would do this, but she was in for a surprise. I wasn't in a hurry, but I made sure my old house was well lit by the flames before walking a couple of blocks to the car. When she drove into her parents' gated community, yes, our little town actually had a gated community with security, she saw their house on fire and her mother standing in the street, wringing her hands. Guess who controlled the computer system of the gated community and their security company? When the fire started, the patrol was busy responding to a burglary alarm. I later learned that Rebecca stayed with her mother for a while longer before they all piled into Rebecca's car and drove to my mother's. Since even the motels seemed to be having problems with their computer systems and couldn't check anyone in. In the end, I parked the company car at the office. I opened the door and threw the last Molotov cocktail at it and then set the car on fire. Unknown to Rebecca, Joshua, and her idiot father, I canceled the insurance on the building and the car. I then walked up to the first fire where firefighters were valiantly trying to stop the fire from spreading. Ronald stood next to the lone fire truck in his expensive white firefighting gear and matching white helmet, directing the half-drunk crew members. With the police running all over the city trying to find out if anyone was on other fires, there was no one to even slow my progress. No fire department came to the rescue, as Ronald refused to sign mutual aid agreements and did his best to alienate other services. They feel like right now. 
I walked up behind Ronald and used the voice changer again. First, I stuck a small dowel into his back. Darth Vader spoke again. Don't turn around or jerk, otherwise, you could get very seriously hurt. Ronald froze and began to speak. Shut up and listen. Your city is on fire. If you don't want this to happen again, you better fix yourself. No one is exempt from retribution, even your own home is now completely on fire. Listen and learn, stop being an ass, otherwise, you will suffer new retribution. I didn't want him to turn around, so I pushed him, and he fell into a hole of mud. It looked the same, his clean white equipment had become dirty. He started to rise to his knees, I kicked him, and he ended up in the mud up to his face. Turning, I walked away, disappearing into the crowd, watching the futile attempts to put out the flames. I reached the hidden pickup truck and headed away from the area well beyond its boundaries. I assumed that I would be under suspicion because even a corrupt department sometimes has to investigate its crimes, and this is simply terrible. I settled in a large metropolitan area located three states away from my hometown. I didn't try to hide, change my name, or find a fake ID. True, I didn't care. I couldn't see my children, they were adopted by Joshua. I didn't have money for child support. I knew the cops would come after me, so I didn't try to open a new business. I simply got a job in the IT department and was soon doing the same job as before. I waited a while before calling my mom's landline. I was so paranoid that I drove 50 miles from my apartment in case law enforcement tried to track my phone. I guess I shouldn't have been so paranoid. Mom was glad to hear from me, her head was spinning from news of local events. First of all, I'm glad you're alive. At first, it was thought that you might have been in the apartment when the building burned, but there was no sign of a body. Someone eventually suggested that you were very unhappy and probably left your resignation letter to Becky and Josh and then left town, but the letter burned down along with the building. Thanks for letting me know you're alive. Secondly, Becky and Josh didn't get married. Looks like he was already married in another state and didn't get a divorce. Becky and the children lived with me until she found a new home. It's actually smaller than the one you lived in before. Thirdly, most of the burned businesses and houses were insured by an insurance agency offered by the bank. They took such a hit with insurance claims that they waived their deductible. When insurance investigators got to the bottom of the big losses, they didn't like the fact that Ronald Maines was the fire chief responsible for pre-planning for possible fires. The insurance company sued Ronald for preventing the fire department from introducing modern firefighting techniques and failing to enter into necessary mutual aid agreements. Fourth, a new bank opened an office here, and many of the burned enterprises received loans from this bank, which reduced the income of Maine's Federal Bank. I didn't know this, but Maine's Federal has a board of directors, and they are unhappy with the way Ronald is running things. Now he is on a short leash. Fifthly, since Becky didn't marry that scumbag Josh, she's withdrawn the protective order and wants to hear from you. Besides, the children are still yours. Becky went to the judge and begged for changes to the divorce because the case had not reached 90 days and was not finalized. I think you can still be married. The kids still ask about you every day when they come here after school. Sixth, did you know that Judge Gavin had a car collection? I think he kept it under his hat, but it burned that night, now it looks ancient. Rumor has it that Ronald insured the cars to reduce the judge's expenses. He only received a couple hundred for each car he owned. Gossips insist he's lost over a million dollars and doesn't like Ronald Maines anymore. We are looking for a new police chief, the sheriff decided not to run again, and some deputies and police officers resigned. Becky's parents are looking for housing, their house was completely destroyed, and while a new house is being built, there is no apartment suitable enough for them to live in. It might be a couple of years before their house is completed, that is if they find a builder. It seems like no one wants to take on this job. She actually asked if I wanted to sell or rent my house to them. I thought about it for about a minute, but then I told her that because of their history of abusing my son, I couldn't trust them with my home. I think Ronald got angry, but since he's in trouble with the law, even the tax man told him to shut up. By the way, they found my tax payment. I believe the tax man got the message that night when his cars and van caught fire. Suddenly, people were much happier as Ronald's influence seemed to fade away, their tax problems disappeared overnight. 
Right now, it seems like the fires are the only concern for business owners and Ronald Maines. Everyone else believes that fire sometimes cleanses. So what are you coming to visit your old mother and your children? I had to grin. I think I need to plan a trip home very soon, although I may have to find a better car. My old car barely made it there. See you very soon, Mom. When I stopped telling you my sad story, I survived the outrageous terms of my unexpected divorce and had the opportunity to take revenge on my wife, her lover, and her father. No one was killed, and only a few volunteer firefighters suffered minor injuries while fighting the fires. Well, actually, with those that they were able to get to, I set my ex-wife's house on fire after warning her to leave using a voice synthesizer. And when she tried to go to her parents, she found it too, engulfed in flames. I moved to another city, many, many kilometers away, and have now settled there. But, and this is a big but, when I talked about my mother's house or the city I grew up in, I called it home. It was hard not to think of the place where I grew up and spent so much time as an adult as my home, but now it was just a memory of home. It has been almost three years since my married life ended, or is it an explosion? I don't know for sure except that my wife, her lover, and my ex-father-in-law, for some unknown reason, conspired to destroy me. If my ex came to me and just said, I fell in love with my old friend, and I'm going to leave you, I would be heartbroken and upset, but I would be able to understand. No, they were supposed to set me up and then destroy me, taking my children away from me and even trying to deprive me of visits. That was the only thing Judge Gavin gave me. They took my business away from me and only gave me a minimum wage job and exorbitant alimony and child support, even though a judge forced me to give up my parental rights. I felt alone when I was denied even the slightest social support from the people I grew up with and did business with on a daily basis. I felt so alone that I didn't even think that I could get a fair solution if I sought legal help, even in the state capitol. I believed that Ronald Maines had long threads of influence, judging by what was happening in the place where I should have felt safest. I had friends in my small town, and they helped me in any way they could, but they could not publicly confront Maine's federal bank and its owner. Their own financial lives were at risk. I tried to minimize the consequences of my actions on those who I knew stood silently by my side, but some may have suffered from my pyromania that fateful night. I still wasn't sure if local law enforcement was looking for me for questioning. Since that night, I have not tried to hide myself by changing my name or even my chosen career, but on the other hand, I didn't admit to anyone where I had moved. Even my mother didn't know where exactly I live now. The company I worked for was a large regional concern with a centralized HR department. I'm sure my ex-wife knew what company I worked for because child support was deducted from my paycheck and deposited into her checking account every week. However, I asked that any request about my personal life, such as my address and phone number, be rejected outright. The company paid great attention to security issues since one of the main characteristics of our company was experience in combating cybercrime and theft of personal data. This meant that her own safety had to be at its best. Nothing spoils your reputation more than knowing that you have been hacked. The HR representative periodically informed all team members that they were receiving outside interest. Every few months, there would be some kind of request from Rebecca's lawyer by email, mail, or even phone, and there were even several attempts by Rebecca herself to find out my information. She even posed as my mother once to try to get past her corporate guardians. If the HR department had received a subpoena from law enforcement agencies or the prosecutor's office, my data would have been provided without problems, but nothing of the kind happened. True, from time to time, I changed phones when I called my mother. Sometimes she had to leave a message for her to call back because she couldn't be sure it wasn't a robot unless she recognized the number. Since I always drove some distance from my new home before calling, I started sending her a text message from that phone before calling. This helped her to be ready to talk to me every time I called. We discussed local news and gossip, of course. They had to include my ex-wife and her evil father for some strange reason. After Joshua had to admit his marital status and left town again, Rebecca insisted that she was still married to me and constantly begged my mother to make me come back. Ha! Ah, little chance of that ever happening. However, over the past few years, I have sneaked back home several times to make sure that my mother, a traditional Christian who preaches forgiveness at any cost, did not tell Rebecca about her plans. I surprised her. I eventually had to throw away the old pickup, but during the time I drove it, 
I managed to save enough money to buy a newer, more reliable vehicle that certainly had better mileage. You may be wondering why I didn't take out a car loan. It's simple, I no longer trusted banks. I needed to have a checking account to get paid, but to do that, I used a large national bank and took out any extra money on payday and invested it in another national brokerage house. I checked my credit score and couldn't get a loan even if I wanted to because my ex-father-in-law reported that I was delinquent on all my loans from his bank. Instead of filing counterclaims with the credit bureaus, I simply paid cash for everything I could to reduce the paper trail. I have never flown or used any form of transportation that would allow my movements to be tracked. I bought all the fuel and cash. Yes, it takes a little more time when you have to go and prepay, and you don't fill up completely at every stop, but then there's no paper trail to catch you. I always went with a couple of thousand in cash, separated and hidden in bags, wallets, and in the car itself, so I always had cash in case I needed it. After checking, I found out which car make and color are the most common. I bought the older model in this color, it was quite economical and did not have many mechanical problems. I found a few motels that were not part of a chain but were clean and quiet along my travel routes and accepted cash, so there was no paper trail there either. Yes, that's what I meant when I said routes in the plural. Sometimes I would add a couple of hundred miles to my route just to make my trips less patterned in case my ex-wife found out about one of my trips home and sicked an investigator on me. Some, of course, will shrug their shoulders and say, what's the problem? I know I sound a little paranoid, but what causes paranoia for me? Almost my entire hometown, including the people I grew up with, went to school with, socialized with, etc., turned against me just because my ex and her evil father decided to destroy me and maybe even conspired to put me in jail. Doesn't that make you a little paranoid? Some others, including my mother, would like me to return to the shrew that is my ex at any cost. Sorry, it won't work. So periodically, I would take a week off and go to Kulon, USA, to see my mother and children. According to our phone conversations, I constantly visited their mother every day after school and stayed with her until Rebecca finished work. Looks like Rebecca had to work extra hours trying to sell the credit since there was competition in our small town. In addition, she had to take care of my old IT business and try to prevent it from collapsing. Through my mother, I learned from many of my former clients that they promised to leave Rebecca if I returned and opened a new business. It was tempting because I really missed home, but after what happened there, I realized that this was no longer the hometown in which I grew up. Therefore, I planned to come to my mother immediately after the children arrived, no warning, so my well-meaning mother couldn't warn Rebecca. I drove up to the house quickly, got out of the car, and approached the house. When my mother opened the door, I extended my hand and asked her for her phone. Then, putting it in my pocket, I greeted my children by the names I wanted to call them, Connie and Ted. They always jumped into my arms when I knelt on the floor and then began to tell me everything they remembered about their lives since the last time I went home. Once we were done with that, I would put them all in the car, including mom, and head to our community in town about an hour away. There, we would eat, watch a movie, maybe go to a children's museum, feed the ducks at the lake in the city park, or do some other fun activity while I talked to my kids and learned from my mom about the family. Of course, as part of the evening, I had to listen to a lecture about the need to turn the other cheek, that forgiveness is a divine thing, and so on. Eventually, I got to the point where I would just nod and let her lecture. It didn't change anything. Mom also described how Rebecca felt physically. Rebecca was sad, she didn't smile anymore. She always asked how I was doing, she wanted to see me, she wanted to ask me for forgiveness for what she had done. This went on for several visits. The only thing missing was that Rebecca never asked me for forgiveness, and secondly, my mother never talked about whether Rebecca loved me. Damn it, I knew the truth, so why make an issue out of it? One day, my mom secretly took my phone, and I caught her texting Rebecca while we were walking. I almost made a big mistake because it made me extremely angry. Before I snatched the phone from her hands and yelled at her, I remembered that this was my mother, the one who carried me for nine months wiped my nose and butt as needed, and raised me. I took a few deep breaths and tried to calmly ask what she wanted to do. Tim, it's simple, Rebecca says. She's worried that you might kidnap the children. She just wants to know where they are and if they are safe. I think since she is their mother, this is a reasonable request. Well, I don't trust her in any way. 
she turned out to be a deceitful woman, and the police would probably arrive in a few minutes. I wanted to call Rebecca A, but young ears were close and could overhear. I finally let us out to the car and drove into a dark corner of the parking lot when my mother began to insist that I was paranoid. A few minutes later, three police cars with two officers each were parked at the front and back doors of the restaurant we visited. I looked at my mother, of course, her reaction was, maybe they didn't come for you. I simply nodded as the officers exited the building and began to look around carefully. Since they had no idea what I was driving and my windows were tinted, the engine was turned off and the headlights were off, they did not pay any attention to my car. They soon became convinced that their prey was gone and set off for their next challenge. Mom still couldn't believe that my ex had made her a scapegoat. Son, Becky asked me to tell her where we are so that she could join us and you could finally talk. You need to sit down with her and figure this out, and maybe you can get back together, she suggested. I shook my head. Why don't you call her right now and see what she has to say about us? I gave her the phone, and she quickly connected with Rebecca. I asked her to turn on the speakerphone, but I myself remained silent. The children took my example and didn't say anything either. Since Rebecca immediately began asking questions, did they catch him? Was he arrested? I told them that he kidnapped my children and took them away from our hometown. My mom had a shocked expression on her face. I know my behavior has hardened, I said, but this tried to arrest me for visiting my own children, and I had the legal right to visit them at any time. This is stated in court documents. Finally, mom answered, no, Tim saw me text you where we were and let us out of the building. We watched this from the parking lot. How could you do this to Tim? What did he do that deserves arrest? I thought you would come and join us, not the police. Rebecca immediately became conciliatory. I. I don't know, she stammered. Whether she realized we were all listening or not, she immediately tried to minimize the damage. Margaret, I just wanted to make sure he would sit down and talk to me. I decided that if he was in custody, he would have to talk to me, then I can drop the charges against him and see what happens next. I shook my head in disgust. This will most likely drop the charges only if I agree to something that will benefit her but will harm my needs and desires, I muttered. Rebecca asked a scary question, where are you guys now? I. I want my children to be safe with me. I couldn't stand it anymore, I said. Listen, my kids are safe with me and my mother. We'll return home tonight. I didn't kidnap them, they are not threatened by anything except your manipulations. If the police tried to arrest me, your children would witness their father being arrested on the orders of their own mother. Have you ever thought about how this will affect them and their relationship with you? And anyway, how could you believe that I could kidnap your children? Why would I deprive them of their mother, even like you? As I spoke, I drove out of the parking lot. If Rebecca was close, she must have been looking for us. I believe she was pulling into another driveway as we were exiting the street. Mom gave me a dirty look but didn't say anything. I gave Rebecca my last comment, we're going home now. I think you'll have to come up with some other charge to get me arrested once we get to Mom's house. Mom turned off the speakerphone because the children began to understand that I was very upset and began to cry. I was ashamed to realize that I called her in front of them. Mom spoke quietly to Rebecca and then turned off the phone to try to reassure Connie and Ted that everything was okay. It took several miles down the road before they began to calm down. How do you explain to almost nine and six-year-olds that their mother tried to get their dad arrested? I was so paranoid that all the way to my mother's house I thought that I could be stopped at any moment. I tried to convince myself that no one knew what kind of car I had, what color or style, and there would never be a reason to create a roadblock to check every car. But I constantly looked in the mirror and tried not to speed. Although it was a little disturbing, back in Culver, I drove around town on the paved county road so I could enter it from a different direction than the or law enforcement would expect. Then I carefully walked a few blocks around my mother's house to make sure there was no ambush there. Finding nothing, I pulled over to the street at the end of the driveway and let the mother and children out. As soon as they got out of the car, I took off and headed away from my hometown and then came back. Yes, I know I'm paranoid, but I successfully escaped again. I usually rented a motel a few miles from home and then came back and visited the children every day for a week, but I was afraid that Rebecca might keep an eye on the children knowing that I was nearby. 
I drove for several hours before stopping for the night at another motel. Something had to change. I decided to contact this. The motel had a decent Wi-Fi signal, so I decided to try video calling so she could see how upset I was. I made sure there was nothing on the screen behind me that could identify my location. I also planned to leave immediately after the call ended in case she was somehow able to track down the motel's IP address. I figured she would have enough time to pick up the kids, take them home, and put them to bed. I was lucky on the first try. I sent her a video call request, and she responded immediately. I really didn't want to look at her, but those were the rules of the game I was playing now. Three years passed, and she still looked good, but I knew that her beauty was only an appearance. Tim, I'm so glad to see you. Why didn't you just come into our house and look at the kids? She asked. Honestly, I have no idea whether the police will be waiting for me when we agree to meet. I'm sure someone decided that I was to blame for all of your and your family's misfortunes over the past few years, I replied. Tim, no one is looking for you. State police came and investigated along with an arson investigator, and they couldn't find enough evidence to point the finger at any one person. Yes, I suppose they think you might have been to blame since no one else left town during the fires, but there are a lot of people here who don't like my father and his business methods. For weeks and months after that, all I heard was whispers about what else was going to happen to Dad. Did you know that the fire department expelled him from their ranks and declared him a black mark? He can't even serve on the board of trustees anymore. Nothing like this could have happened to a nicer person, she said. In fact, I do not care. The only thing I want is to visit my children. Period. The rest of us can jump off a cliff, and we'll all be better off. Are you still in town? Can I see you? What will I be arrested for? Kidnapping my own children whom, according to a court decision, I can visit at any time without warning or reservation? I asked. She looked a little taken aback by this remark. I thought it would make you sit down and talk to me. I would never press charges against you, she replied. Yes, and every time I was stopped for some minor violation, it would show that I was once detained for kidnapping. I don't think their systems show that. I might not have been tried or convicted. Sorry, but I can't help you with this matter. Also, if you withdraw your complaint, won't you be guilty of making a false report? It would look good under file, I said. They would never do that to me. Dad won't tolerate this, she insisted. Yes, still the same, Rebecca. Dad will fix everything. I have the right to do whatever I want, even if it violates the law or my ex-husband's rights, she said confidently. She dropped a bombshell on me. You are not my ex-husband. You and I are still married she said. I shook my head. Sorry, but I have documents according to which we are divorced, and I am no longer the father of my children. That's why I call them your children. After the fire, I turned to my lawyer with a request to cancel the divorce since a full 90 days had not passed. It was not recorded as final. Judge Gavin was so angry at my father for losing his car collection that he readily signed it. For some reason, Dad got very angry. What did you do to him to make him so angry? I have no idea. I was happy. I had a loving wife, two wonderful children, a good business, a certain authority in society, and suddenly I had absolutely nothing, and I was threatened with prison or hard labor because you and your family set me up. I was forced to leave to be sure that a trumped-up accusation would not appear on my doorstep, I explained. She seemed surprised by my point of view on all this. No, that's not what we wanted at all. Really, she protested. Do you see the expression on my face? In my opinion, it qualifies as incredulous. Why did you force me to give away my children without warning or notice? Why couldn't I find a local lawyer, or didn't have time to find one elsewhere? Why did you take over my company and demand that I work for damn minimum wage to keep it going? I think you and your dear daddy, along with your buddy Josh for some strange reason, wanted me to screw up and end up in jail, I said firmly. She shook her head in denial. Well, yes, of course. All they did was look after my interests, she defended. I continued, and just so I know who's in charge here, last night you had me in bed until I couldn't see you anymore, and the next morning, you called me names, dropped your bomb, and left, taking my children away. You tore my world apart and trampled my heart as it beat on the floor. 
The last straw was when your father tried to destroy my mother by filing trumped-up charges against her for not paying her property taxes. You bastards tried to put her out on the street for no reason. No, dad would never act so vilely. He wouldn't harm your family, I concluded bitterly. I had to laugh, and it wasn't a happy laugh. He sounded harsh and angry. Then why did you do everything possible to destroy me? If you came and told me that you fell in love with Josh again, I would give you a divorce. I would never try to keep someone who doesn't love me anymore. No, you should have taken everything and left me with no options. Dad said it would keep you around and that by giving up the kids, you wouldn't be able to sue for custody, but you'd still have to make sure we had the income we needed befitting the mains. Oh, that worked so well. Your dad started the rumor, I couldn't buy groceries or even put gas in my company car. I couldn't buy basic furniture, nobody could even talk to me. Everything had to appear as if by magic so that I could survive. You denied me everything and wanted me to pay the bills. I had nothing more than my mother, and you tried to destroy even her. This was the last straw. I couldn't let you bastards hurt her. Damn, I just confessed. I hope she didn't write it down, that would be the only thing Ronald would need to put me behind bars for years to come. I struggled to regain control of my anger. Rebecca was still trying to deny everything when I disconnected the connection. Damn, I needed to leave, and leave right now. I was dead tired from the stress of the day, but I got out and drove another couple hundred miles in the wrong direction before pulling off a quiet highway and hiding behind a grove of tall, dense trees to sleep. This was the closest call I've ever had to one of my secret visits to the kids. I continued to do my due diligence. Whenever I contacted my mom, I used one of my phones, occasionally using Skype to see the kids. They were growing so fast that I wished I could be there to see them every day, but my paranoia wouldn't allow it. I finally saved enough money to hire a lawyer. I paid her in cash to verify my marital status and parent status. Hell, Rebecca wasn't lying when she said we were still married because this was true. I removed the child support deduction from my paycheck, this didn't deserve any money directly from me. Instead, I sent them to my mom with the instruction that they should benefit Connie and Tad, not Rebecca. She could distribute them at her discretion. I know she probably just gave the entire amount to Rebecca, but it made me feel more confident. The lawyer also discovered that my children's adoption had been cancelled. I think Josh didn't want to have any more kids unless he was going to get the keys to the kingdom. I can't imagine how he was going to get rid of his previous wife and children, but I didn't care. I probably should have followed him, but I figured I'd thwarted his plans enough. When I found out that I was still married, I went ahead and filed for divorce. This meant that I would have to return to my hometown to attend the hearing. Even though my lawyer was convinced that there was no active arson investigation, I was reluctant to come back publicly. Ronald had his horns cut, but he was still a force to be reckoned with. I had no idea how he was going to fight me, but I had to be on guard at all times. The day before the first hearing, I slipped into town and checked into a small motel on the outskirts. Of course, I registered under the usual fictitious name, John Smith. The motel owner knew me and silently agreed to keep my secret. On the morning of the hearing, I left the gun in the car since there were now metal detectors in the courthouse. I was completely unarmed. I didn't even have a pocket knife to protect myself in case Ronald tried to do something in the courtroom. When the hearing began, Judge Gavin, yes, the same judge who screwed me earlier, immediately wanted to listen to Rebecca and her lawyer. What do you want from this hearing? He asked. Surprisingly, she wanted counseling and to have me back as her husband. I was not allowed to speak, but I sat and shook my head. Of course, Rebecca tried to portray our marital history as one of misunderstanding and confusion about her true feelings. Lord, Lord, what nonsense. And of course, the good judge seemed to buy her horse hockey. After Rebecca told her story about how I abandoned my family, my lawyer got a chance to answer. I told her everything, even about my night of fire and retribution. Fortunately, she avoided that night. The good judge objected to her characterization of his actions from the dock, but she pointed out that everything he did on that fateful day of my first divorce proceedings was public knowledge and could not be refuted. He finally stopped hammering, looking at my face. Somehow, I think he suddenly worried about his potential new losses. I simply nodded as he realized his potential new losses. He leaned back in his chair and fell silent. 
The lawyer continued with my story. When she got to the kidnapping episode, the good judge suddenly became carried away again and leaned forward. He looked not at me, but at Rebecca, with a stern expression, he raised his hand to silence my mouthpiece. This is true. Did you actually file a complaint that Mr. Meharan abducted the children and tried to arrest him, even though the visitation permit issued by this court stated that he could visit the children at any time? Rebecca, like a deer caught in headlights, looked at her lawyer for help. He didn't play along with her. The judge became a little more decisive. For God's sake, why would Tim come back here and get married to you again? I admit that the whole divorce process was quick and there seemed to be good reasons for it, but this man was persecuted and ostracized in his hometown. His mother was persecuted again. Why should he want to come back to you? Is it only for the sake of the children or only for the sake of your imaginary benefit? What should he do when your panties start twitching again? Is he expected to go through the same horrible treatment again? Before Rebecca had time to respond, her lawyer jumped up as if he had been electrocuted and asked for a short break and the opportunity to meet with the lawyers in private. My lawyer just shrugged his shoulders but did not object. Judge Gavin lowered his gavel and left the courtroom. Both lawyers left with him and appeared only a few minutes before the hearing resumed. Upon his return, the judge looked angry, Rebecca's lawyer looked ashamed, but my lawyer smiled. After the rehearing, Judge Gavin called a surprise witness, Ronald Maines. Please take the oath and take the witness stand. Little did I know that my father-in-law was actually present at the hearing. I didn't know why he wanted to be there other than to support his daughter, and I saw no reason why he should support her attempt to win me back. Ronald walked forward and gave me an angry look as he passed the table. He took the oath and then sat as a ruler on his throne. The judge began the interrogation. Tell the court, Mr. Maines, why you are here and what contribution you can make to the trial. My hopefully soon-to-be ex-father-in-law gave the judge a dirty look somewhat similar to the one he gave me and began ranting. I don't know why my stupid daughter wants that pathetic son of a back. He only caused us heartache and suffering. I can't even tell you how much money my bank and I lost because of his actions. I want this little to go to jail and hopefully throw away the key. The judge slammed his gavel to stop the tirade. In the office, your daughter's lawyer hinted that you have something important for the court. Please get started with this. I was surprised that the kind judge did not reprimand Ronald for his profanity. Ronald didn't look punished, he really looked out of control. My daughter should not have agreed to marry this chicken. He is a lowlife from a lowly family. When my daughter brought him in, I was shocked, but she had to have him. I put up with it until Joshua Webster came to work for me. I made sure that Rebecca and he were together as often as possible and decided that Joshua would seduce her. Since they were high school sweethearts, this shouldn't have been too difficult. She resisted a little longer than I expected, but in the end, she fell under his spell. It's only a pity that at this time, she did not become pregnant from him. The judge asked, what about the little fact that Joshua Webster was already married and had children of his own? The plan was that once Rebecca was divorced, he would quietly divorce his wife and give up rights to his children and then become the father of Constant and Thaddeus, which is what I wanted from the beginning. Mayron should never have fed anyone of my blood. I was outraged to no end every time I had to endure him sitting at my table for any reason. The judge allowed him to continue for a few minutes before asking another question. Was it your intention to force Mr. Mayron to leave the city or go to prison? I wasn't really interested in it, but prison was the preferred outcome. Then we could prove why he should not communicate with my daughter or her children. So, is it true that you used your bank to persecute Mr. Mayron and create conditions under which he could break the law? Were the phone calls from Mrs. Mahone violating the protective order incitement on your part? Ronald smiled. Yes, Judge, it was my idea. I asked Rebecca to call her ex-husband and then called the police on him. I have no idea why he was never arrested and convicted of violating orders to stay away from Rebecca. The judge nodded. Thank you, Mr. Maines, that's all. You can leave. Ronald still had an unpleasant expression on his face as he left the witness box. It changed slightly as the judge continued. I advise you to consult with your lawyer. I am providing the official record and transcript of the trial to the district attorney for possible prosecution. You, sir, abused your position in society to persecute this man. 
Unfortunately, this happened with my help and is something I am trying to correct before I retire. A dissatisfied expression appeared on Ronald's face. Apparently, his influence was no longer as strong as before. He turned and stared at his former friend. The judge smiled at him. Ronald lowered his head slightly and walked towards the exit of the courtroom. The judge turned back to Rebecca's lawyer. Do you have anything else before I make a decision? The lawyer quickly jumped to his feet. Your Honor, my client had no idea what her father and her lover were planning. She was an innocent victim just like Mr. Mayoran. That is why she asked for counseling with the goal of reconciliation and returning to the happy marriage they had before Mr. Joshua Webster came to town. Judge Gavin looked at me and my lawyer. We both shook our heads. The judge spoke again. I'm sorry, Rebecca, but you may have been somewhat of an innocent dupe in all of this, but that doesn't justify the hell you put your husband through during and after the divorce hearing. You treated him disgustingly and even tried to arrest him on false charges. I can't imagine how he could forgive you enough to let you get so close to him again. Rebecca jumped up and started screaming that she loved me and her children needed me back. The lawyer calmed her down before the judge could hold her accountable for contempt of court. Judge Gavin continued. If your husband had asked for sole custody of the children, I would have even considered this petition based on your attitude towards him. But he turned out to be the best person in this room. The terms of the offer are generous. He does not even ask for his business to be returned to him. I decide the case in favor of the plaintiff. With these words, he slammed the gavel again, stood up, and left the hall. Now I was a truly free man. Rebecca sat and cried. The lawyer tried to console her. My lawyer shook my hand and asked if I would like to file a civil suit against my ex-father-in-law. I shook my head. My children must have some kind of relationship with this, and his wife. I won't interfere with this. She nodded, and we left the courtroom. Rebecca tried to grab my jacket sleeve and begged me to talk to her as we walked out the door. She distracted me, and I almost missed a movement on the right side. Now, I have to tell you something. I'm not a fighting person. I wasn't a Navy SEAL, an Army Ranger, or a Navy SEAL. I don't do MMA to stay in shape, but one of my favorite films is The Quiet Man with John Wayne. I love the moment when his brother-in-law tries to hit him in an open field in front of everyone in town. I always kept this technique of his in mind as a method of self-defense, and Ronald hit me on the sly as I was leaving the hall. He aimed for my head, and I ducked a little, and his fist flew past, leaving him completely unprotected. I threw a short left hook to the midsection like John Wayne did, and damn it worked. He was very powerful. Ronald's breath rushed out of his open mouth, and he began to arch in pain and the need to try to catch his breath. I hit him with my right hand in the face, and he fell to the floor. I stood with clenched fists and waited for him to rise. I wasn't going to hit him in his weak spots right in front of witnesses, even though he deserved it. At that moment, county bailiffs arrived and rushed to arrest Ronald for assault. By the time Ronald's head cleared and he could breathe again, he was handcuffed and read his rights. Of course, he compounded his problems by threatening me while he was being helped to his feet and then attempting to headbutt the bailiff. This added a felony charge since all bailiffs in our county are sheriff's deputies, and hitting a law enforcement officer is always a felony. Rebecca just stood there speechless. Neither she nor anyone else had ever seen me behave like this. I nodded to her lawyer, and he nodded back. He then turned around and tried to get Ronald to calm down before adding other felonies to the charge. Rebecca, listen to me. It's over now. Don't screw it up and don't deny me time with the kids. Your father needs you. Call your mom and try to help him before he completely breaks down. She stared at me before it finally dawned on her. With a sad, almost mournful expression on her face, she nodded and turned to help her father regain what little dignity he had left. The adrenaline began to wear off and my right arm began to hurt. I looked at it and took a moment to try to figure out why a pair of fingers seemed crooked. When the pain reached its limit, I realized that I must have broken my arm. My lawyer saw the shocked look on my face and rushed to put me in her car and take me to the hospital, where an x-ray confirmed the fact that Ronald's head was as hard if not harder than my hand. Soon, I was given painkillers and put in a cast. God bless her. My lawyer stayed with me and took me to my mother's house for rehab. 
The only bad thing about my injury was the pain and the need for corrective surgery for the fractures to heal properly. Otherwise, I was able to see my children every day for the next week while I recovered and got to know them better. I put up with Rebecca coming every evening to pick up the kids. She and my mother used this opportunity to try to get me back into married life. I would spend extra time with the kids or take long walks while she was there. A week later, I was returning to my new city and my job. Several more years passed, my children are growing up. In the summer and holidays, they stay with me for several weeks. Sometimes their mother takes them, sometimes they fly to me. Yes, now everyone knows where I live. At first, Rebecca even brought them by car a couple of times, but she decided it wasn't worth making such a long trip if she had to stay in a motel after she brought the kids to me. In the end, she realized that there would be no return to a close relationship with me. We remained polite because of the children. I've forgiven her enough to not call her anymore. After many of my former clients sent letters asking to come back and take back their business, I convinced Rebecca to buy her company from her and turn my old company into a district office. It was small, but it prospered and increased overall profits. I was responsible for making it profitable, so I flew into the nearest regional airport every month and then used a rental car to service customers. But we had good local people to handle most of the issues. Rebecca went through several different boyfriends before finally starting a long-term relationship with her former lawyer. They had no intention of having any more children, so they simply lived in sin. Ronald was convicted but served his sentence only on weekends for six months. It would seem like a light sentence, but he also had to complete 200 hours of community service. A kind judge told him to either clean the city's ditches or help cook and serve food to the homeless. I think Ronald has become a pretty good cook. In fact, he continued to serve after serving his sentence. He then received five years probation. Mom is doing well. She has found a new man who provides her with the companionship she needs in retirement. They are happy, and she loves her two grandchildren and sees them every day unless they come to see me. And we can't forget about good old Josh. I don't know who gave him to his wife, but I think she played hell with him for several years. She first kicked him out, filed a separation, and made it so that he had virtually no income after he paid for the house, cars, and child support. She then divorced him after luring him home one night and making him believe a reconciliation was possible. But no, she tied him to a chair and had sex with a couple of his best friends in front of him and then kicked him out of the house again. Now he is divorced and has little prospects. As for me, I'm still a work in progress. I have serious problems with trusting women, especially potential relatives. I date and have a good sex life at times. There are many previously attached women in the world, most of them have baggage and children. I date to try to be a good influence on children but don't make any commitments. I try to be honest with any woman when we start dating. Each of them begins to believe that she will be the one to fix me, but something always happens that makes me believe that we cannot have a long-term relationship. I have a therapist, and we are trying to make the necessary adjustments. I now have a three-bedroom house that I paid cash for. Yes, I still don't trust banks very much, although my credit score has improved, thanks to my ex-father-in-law. He corrected his reports to the credit bureaus without any request from me. Maybe I should have punched him in the face at the beginning of our relationship. No, nothing good would come of that. In any case, I am not dissatisfied with my life. Of course, I miss close relationships, but watching how most of the marriages around me fall apart for one reason or another, I think that I'm not so behind the times, as they say. Life goes on.